Hi, I'm Lena Rao. Welcome to our Ask a VC show where we put VCs in the hot seat. I'm here today with Patricia Nakash, partner at Trinity Ventures. Thank you so much for joining us, Patricia. Thanks for having me. Um, just a little bit on your bio. Uh, at Trinity, you focus on investments in consumer internet, and um, you've made investments in Beachmint, Care.com, ThreadUp, Kixi, Info Army, and a, and a number of others. Um, so lots of e-commerce here, which is which is I think super interesting. Uh, and one of our readers sent in an, a, a good question. Um, e-commerce has been increasingly a difficult arena to compete in, but Zulily, which is a Trinity investment, um, seems to be thriving, which I completely agree with. I have like a Zulily problem. Um, <laughs> what is the As key? Do to, many people? Yeah. What is? <laughs> unfortunately, my husband is very upset about it. But um, what are the keys to their success? And I'm really yeah. curious about this. Like, what yeah. is Zulily? doing that, you know, others in the space yeah. have not been able to capture? Yeah. I, a couple of things. I mean, first of all, I have to give credit to the management team. They are, um, um, Mark Vadon is the chairman, Daryl Cavins is the CEO. Uh, Mark was the founder of Blue Nile and CEO of Blue Nile. Uh, Daryl was the senior executive of Blue Nile. So these guys are seasoned like, e-commerce For our readers, guys. those are, that's an enormous jewelry um, It's a e jewelry commerce site, company. Yeah. Actually, it was a Trinity portfolio company. But m my point is that they are <clears throat> seasoned e-commerce executives. And so their insight from that experience is that uh, inventory can be really debilitating for an early stage company that's growing fast. And they really designed the Zulily business model around minimizing inventory. So most of their product is on consignment. Really? Which has really enabled them to scale capital uh, efficiently. I'd say the other, you know, the other aspect of what they do that they do incredibly well um, is that not only do they manage that operational complexity of handling all that product that comes in on consignment and gets shipped out to their consumers, but they also understand the power of great merchandising. You know, they, they understand that um, you need to bring great product and great value to, to your consumers. And every single day, they produce the equivalent of multiple catalogs, every single day. So when you think about the just the effort that goes into that, um, it's pretty it's pretty wild. And is there still sort of a lot of growth opportunity there in that like mommy segment? You know, I mean, that's definitely, I mean, I'm a new mom, so I yeah. like I would say that's probably where yeah. I'm spending a lot of my money is on my child. Is there an opportunity there to continue to grow? And uh, you know, how do, how do they balance that? Yeah, I think the, the kids space is, is a very deep well. And I mean, Trinity has invested behind multiple companies tapping into that, Zulily right. being one prime example, another one being ThreadUp. Um, people, you know, are willing to spend a lot of money on their children. Um, and, uh, and that's, and, and you kind of add to that the fact that I think women have increasing purchasing power on the web. You know, I'd say, I think it's the latest stats are like over 60% of dollars spent on the web are from women. And then when you get into apparel, uh, the apparel vertical, it's over 70%. So we think, it, we think that there's still a ton of opportunity there. Well, I it, that th thread up in particular brings me to my next question because I think, um, you know, there seems to be a, a, a kind of resurgence of interest in marketplaces. And ThreadUp is a marketplace for, um, you know, used children's clothing and most recently women's clothing. Um, there's a lot of others that are sort of trying to angle in there, especially on the women's side, um, and competing with the likes of big players like eBay or even Amazon. So, you know, what is the new opportunity here and why has there been a resurgence in the marketplace model, particularly with e-commerce? You know, I think a, a really key theme here, I think it's true for ThreadUp and I think it's, it's true across other verticals is that consumers increasingly expect a frictionless experience. I, you know, that our expectations are just getting higher and higher. Right. I mean, from things like same day delivery, next day delivery, whatnot. So for example, in the case of ThreadUp, what they've done is created a completely frictionless seller experience. So it's so easy to load a bag, a ThreadUp bag with clothing, um, and put it on your front doorstep, get it picked up by the post office, you can never pay a dime, um, and let ThreadUp do all the work of sorting through it and pricing it. Whereas in an eBay environment, you would be doing all that work yourself. And I think right. that's a theme that we're gonna see more and more, which is creating a really frictionless experience for the consumer, but the back-end complexity of that, that the, that the company has to manage, is, is more extreme. And how much does mobile have to do with that frictionless experience? Because you have to think, you know, yeah the ease of use of marketplaces um, 
when it's, you know, instead of having to be, you know, on your computer doing it, if you were, you know, on your phone or your iPad, like what, how does that change the use of some of those products? Yeah, I, I think the mobile, the mobile trend is, is huge and undeniable. I mean, we're seeing in our e-commerce companies up to 50% of the traffic coming from mobile, both tablet and smartphone. Um, and it does, it does cr uh, create the need for an experience that, first of all, on the payment side, it needs to be a lot more seamless because putting in payment information on your smartphone can be a real pain. Yeah, for sure. Um, it needs to be more visual. Um, I think people really expect a great visual experience um, on mobile. So I, there are a bunch of elements that I think these marketplaces, these new, this new generation marketplaces are taking advantage of. So I want to switch gears to another reader question, which is more, um, you know, in sort of the inside VC world. Um, this reader says, I'm a successful angel investor looking to get into Silicon Valley. What would be the best way for an outsider like me to land a gig, preferably as like an EIR at a VC firm in the Valley? So, you know, can you speak from the Trinity standpoint? Absolutely. So I would say, first of all, it's really, I think not all EIR programs are, are alike, and right. it's important to research uh, each firm's EIR program to understand what they're about. In the case of Trinity, we really pride ourselves on having an EIR program. Our EIRs are really integrated into our day-to-day -day process, so they attend our partner meetings, for example, which I think is pretty unusual. Right. Because of that, we, we usually only have about two EIRs at a time because to integrate them fully, we, we can't have, you know, a cast of thousands. Um, so... We typically have two um, at any given time, and we look for people who uh, either bring to us complementary networks, um, have areas of expertise that kind of coincide with our areas of investment focus, or that are just you know have a great idea or you know some interesting ideas of companies they want to start. So those are sort of the flavors of people that we look for um, in our sort of you know EIR program, um, and that's what you know if, if um, I would advise this, you know, this person to sort of, you know, look at sort of some of the areas Trinity is investing in and see whether there's a match. What's the best outcome for an EIR? You know, is it that they start a company? Is it that they join the portfolio company? And how does that break down when it, in the percentage? Because it sounds like you have an established yeah. EIR program. So what percentage are really going and starting their own thing? You know, for se success for us um, can be, is, is really whatever the EIR is trying to accomplish. So, and, and we usually have, you know, an understanding of that before they join. So it can either be starting a company and, you know, from our perspective, there are no strings attached. We would love to be a part of that um, new company if, you know, it matches our investment interests. Um, but understand that we might not, uh, might not be what we look for over the course of the EIR program is to kind of build that relationship and trust such that we would be um, the, the preferred investment partner. Um, but for many of our EIRs, they're literally looking to either join a portfolio company, sometimes even join a you know, bigger established company. We've had EIRs go from Trinity EIR program to joining Google. Um, and that's great if that's their objective and what they're looking to do. We've actually had, we've had EIRs become VCs at other venture firms. Right. Um, and, you know, Which is happening more often, I'd say. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you know, and from our perspective, you know, again, during the duration of that EIR period, you know, hopefully we've been able to share our network and our deal flow with that individual and vice versa. Um, so, you know, it, it typically, you know, is a win-win situation. What we like to say is once an EIR at Trinity, you're, you're part of the Trinity family for life. So it's, it's a three-month gig, but you're part of the family forever. So last question, and, and it's more of a personal one. Um, you know, you've been in VC now f since 1999. So that's a pretty long time. You've gone through the dot-com bubble and yeah. bust, and then now <laughs> this, this new wave of innovation. What's the biggest change that you've seen within the VC world? Like within your, you know, this sand hill bubble, what, what's the biggest change you've seen? You know, for sure, I feel like there's, over the course of those, you know, 14 years, I've seen more specialization. So I've seen people, you know, venture capitalists really become more focused on particular sectors and going deep on those. And I'd say the other big shift has been sort of the institutionalization of sort of the seed stage financing, which I think has been sort of, you know, great for the for innovation in the Valley and for the entrepreneurial community. So um, probably the combination of those two have been the biggest changes. Great. I well, wish I could say more women in the venture. <laughs> 
<laughs> but that really hasn't changed too much. Well, maybe that's a conversation <laughs> for another day. <laughs> Thanks so much, Patricia. I really appreciate you joining us. Absolutely. Thank you.